everything was good. He created what was good. And there was a relationship in nature. We existed in nature. We had a garden. We, we lived amongst the animals. But he also says that God to prepare, or I'm going to prepare a place for you. Mm -hmm. So you feel like that place is here? I, I do. We'll see if I'm right. But don't hang your head on it, right? You know, where, where is it? It's not here in June or it's going to be in January. Oh, it's going to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? What do you think? How, how do you perceive it? They were in our 20s. Oh, that part, yeah. In our 20s without any, yeah. Leave, a, leave us a forwarding address if you find it. Okay. <laughs> well, he's going to take me there because I'm feeble-kneed. Didn't we talk about this one day that helped that love imagery of C.S. Lewis at the end of his last book of the Narnia series? He talks about going into, it's like a shadow map. His, and this is just C.S. Lewis after studying um, that everything we're in is like a shadow when he gets into heaven. Like it was almost like this mm -hmm. that it becomes clear and everything is about sin and what it was meant to be and like what happened before was almost like a, a push, I don't know. I just thought it was a cool way of thinking of what the new heaven and earth may be like and that what we see now even as we think of the sin is like blurred and just it's the, what the intention is, is that the way he meant for it. So that's it. how, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We're never going to get this done. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we got so much more here, and I spent a little too much time to begin. But look, this is 35. What does 35 do for you, chapter 35, after going through 34? Well, it makes me realize that if I had my choice, I sure wouldn't want to be existing in chapter 34. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> so much hope. And the reason why the hope is, is that all what I, who I am in the midst of this whole thing and what God does for me. And every one of those things, you know, and, and you know the the the, the, the basis of um, the center of sin. What, what do you think the center of sin is? What's what would you suggest is kind of the foundation of what sin is? If you could say it in one word, selfishness. Okay. Selfishness. Anybody else? I think you said pride once. Yeah, and I would suggest selfishness is right there in parallel to that. Self-centeredness. Yeah. Self-centeredness or pride, yeah, right. And and we try to find try to try to find salvation or the gospel where any of that exists in the human being in the scriptures. Be careful. I mean, you might want to show me places like where where you're instructed to do the right thing, but that's law. You are instructed to do the right thing, but whenever you get a chapter like this, in the contrast to chapter thirty-four. You get 35, and I just love the strengthening with the feeble hands and everything. And who do I think of? You and I are post-Jesus, post-resurrection. That's exactly what Jesus did when he came, right? What did he do? In fact, they said, you know, even the prophet Joel in, in, in Isaiah says, you know, that's, that's how you're going to know. That one of the reasons why you're going to know he's the Messiah is that he's going to perform those kinds of miracles for people who are helpless. So he feeds them when they're hungry. He gives the sight, the blind uh, sight. The guy's on a mat. His buddies take him, put him through a room. He, 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 there's nothing this boy can do except his buddies take him to Jesus. Jesus enables him to walk. All these miracles that he performs. Now, the, the problem that we have is we always stop with the miracle and say that's that's what it is. And I've said this before. You don't you don't understand the miracles of Jesus until you understand the miracle of the cross. And realize that I'm feeble, so that definitely means that all this stuff we talk about in our world, where I have to handle all the, or try to handle, or try to go through this life with all the problems that exist, whether it's depression, whether it's physical ailments, whether I'm emotional about something, whatever it is, my pain and struggle in working, whatever it is, that's me. I'm that feeble guy in the midst of this, and this makes me feel a whole lot better for who I am. Because 
the, the gospel is, he's going to give me the sight. He's going to give me it. And ultimately, none of those things, every one of those people who got sight and the lame guy who was able to walk, he, he died and he was not able to walk anymore. Until you find and realize that every one of those miracles points to the ultimate miracle of Christ who is risen and he takes us with us. And then, okay, I understand now. In this world, I will have trouble, like Jesus says. But what? Take heart, I have overcome the world. And it can only produce humility in you. And it's the opposite of the pride. It's the opposite of the pride. And the most humble one was, of course, Jesus, who, again, is the center of all of it, who sacrifices for the pride of the world. So, if, if that being the case, and this is very messianic, this is also eschatological, it puts me in a place where I'm once again relieved to know that only God does this, and He has it in His control. It makes me feel a whole lot better when I get up in the morning and I'm a grouch. You are too. Maybe not in the morning, but you have your, your problems too. Don't you think that's beautiful? This is and it's poetic. And I sure hope there are animals that I think there are. I think there are. Anybody else want to add to it? Anybody? Well, I had a thought, actually. Yeah. Well, to put the two chapters together, mm -hmm. when you read, um, be strong, like the middle of 35, be strong and not fear your God will come, will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, will come to save you. Mm -hmm. well, I have the, the image of, like let's say you're in a Nazi concentration camp, and you just have evil around you, and then, you know, God or the, you know, the U.S. soldiers come and destroy the German captors. You know, they've come in with their sword, and delivered vengeance, and now the, the, the just have found their salvation, but they found it through bloodshed. I mean, it's, it's like it didn't come without people got, had to get wiped out first, and then we get saved. I've never kind of put those two together. Mm -hmm. you never think of. I think you're right. I, I think you're absolutely right. And by the way, those, what you, I got written here, this is Isaiah's thing. What you just read, I suggest, is the whole theme of Isaiah, right there in those verses. And I think you're right. And this is, I guess, the point that I, 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 um, I probably butchered it the way I was trying to explain it, but I think you may be explaining it better than me. Right? Uh, so, you're you're in there in the Nazi. Well, you have Nazis. Like say Nazis. Okay. Like Nazi Nazi camp has you, right? Where the innocent people are right, supposed to be right. totally and, 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 and they're destroyed for your salvation. Like Israel was destroyed. Well, the captors, like God comes in God, and destroys yep. the captors. Yes. So, so the same all thing the is true. People are, are destroyed, and then that's how we become saved. Right. Now. So that's how and we, that's how Egypt. That's how Israel was able to be released from Egypt when the firstborns were killed, right? Same thing. Except I might be struggling with the fact that if there was a boy over there or whatever, okay, but that the point is that that happens, right? And you know, I think now, you know, up, up through the, 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 the Bible there's been bits and pieces of it and then mm -hmm. the culmination where it's going to be just little bits and pieces of it. Right. The whole world will be a little bit, so now we have to destroy it. Yes. Now, but here's the thing. So, evil people got destroyed and the guy was, was rescued. So he had to kill the evil people to rescue the person. Right. And, and that's, isn't that as good as it gets? Right? Um, so what, 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 does, what does our government try to do? One of the things that um, New Haven Police Department tries to do for us is to bring punishment to the bad guy to keep us safe, all right? You have the extreme example of that. And that, in the end, is as far as earthly righteousness goes, all right? And I would suggest that each one of these examples fit that. Either, either if, a, if, if Herod kills 
the children of Bethlehem in order to destroy the prophecy of the Christ, he fails and he's got carnage, right? Nobody's saved there. Maybe Jesus is, because he's off in Egypt, though. It's the work of, huh? He was gone before. Exactly. The work of God did. So it was that was a slaughter. Now, and that's, this is where our righteousness ends, see? This, this is maybe the point, is that that's as good as it can get for us. But every one of those things are pointing to the fulfillment of it. They're, okay, so you're that guy, and you, they killed the Nazis, and you're free, and now you can live the rest of your life, and you die at age 85, right? We would all look at that story and say, we killed the bad guy so the good guy can live. And is that righteous? Was that righteous? What do you think? Yeah, the bad guys got their justice. Right. And the innocent people got their right. And that's as good as that's as good as it gets for us. That's as far as we can go. Okay. Right. And those are all earthly examples of sacrifice or wrath or whatever. And God uses those. They, they happen in history. But again, in the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed. In the, Old, in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. Ultimately, ultimately all of this. That's why the slaughter and the sacrifices to get together, it ultimately doesn't work until who? Christ. And Christ is the eschatological end of it. Does that make sense? Help me out here. Chapter 34 and 35, is, say again? He was the only good guy. He, you know, ultimately, he is the only good guy. Right, right. And he, he is the perfectly innocent one who dies, right? So his righteousness is what we ultimately look for. Because every time when we look for righteousness here, we might find it like that, but we also find what? We don't, it, isn't, it isn't solid. It doesn't, uh, there's a lot of people that get hurt and they don't get there. They don't get saved in the context of our world today. So all of these are examples of, but the point of prophecy is God uses these examples in Scripture to point to the ultimate thing. And what does it do? It, 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 brings, my, it brings the righteousness of you being saved by the good guys, uh, but it doesn't fulfill. It's not fulfilled. It's not the end. You're still going to die. There's still a problem. But they, that will be an example. I would suggest the soldier. We all, we all talk about our soldiers, our, our, our armed forces, and how we honor them. Because why? The, those who sacrifice their lives for us. We always say that, right? That's probably as good as it gets as far as human heroes go. Right? But is it satisfying? Is it the final? No. Okay? And that's why what we have is the ultimate... The ultimate one is God being sacrificed. Holy innocence, even of Bethlehem, still has to bow to Jesus. We all do. Because it, it, it points to ultimately. And that's why I would suggest what we need to do as human beings is we move from kingdoms of this world. This is, this is the point of Isaiah, dear friends. Listen. This is, what, this is what he's been saying throughout the whole thing. I'll use kingdoms for my purpose, but out of Judah will come. That's why I'm going to save Judah. Not for Judah's sake, well, for Judah's sake, yeah, but not because Judah has the righteousness. See? But out of all the ashes, this is why we have the ashes. Uh, the kingdom rises from the ashes. What? And that is me dying with Christ. That becomes so... I move from the righteousness of this world, which is incomplete, and where does my heart go? Where does my trust go? I trust the American armed forces, I do, to protect me. But where does that finally go? Ultimately, it's trusting Christ for the kingdom that is to come. That's what Isaiah is saying. And now he's speaking eschatologically for that. Does this make sense? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. Exactly. That's why we sing that. And so it pulls me away from these kingdoms and brings me to the ultimate kingdom. And 
and this is why an eschatological theme is so beautiful, and I would suggest that's one of our things as Christians, is we need to always look at the eternal perspective of things, right? Because that's the only thing that's ultimately going to satisfy you. All right. Any thoughts, other thoughts? Thank you. I, I think you, 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 you explained so, it better so, than I did. So you could say that by the same token, then, I mean, he's talking about nations, but you really be talking about individuals. Absolutely. Until we're destroyed, yep. you know, by the same destruction of our evil, then that's where our redemption comes from. That's right. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Yeah. Hmm. And ultimately, it does become a personal thing. But, you know, Isaiah is speaking in terms of nations, and so does Jesus, though. What does Jesus do? He comes in, he says, my kingdom, my kingdom. My kingdom is like this, my kingdom is like that. He's a king. What's your kingdom like? Oh, it's not of this world. This guy's crazy. That's because it doesn't uh, fall. Huh? That's because it doesn't fall. It doesn't fall. My kingdom is forever. <laughs> We're speaking of forever here, aren't we? Right? Kind of goes with what you were saying too. That I, I looked up what eschatology means because I, I wasn't uh -huh. sure what I would read. And it, in my phone, it says um, the part of theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. But then in quotes, it says Christian hope is concerned with eschatology or the science of last things. Right. So therein is our hope. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Two main things for a Christian to always focus on, and that is the eternal perspective and understand that until you get there, you're going to carry your cross. Carry your cross and follow Jesus into his kingdom. And in the context of Isaiah 35, ye with feeble hands and unsteady knees. <laughs> okay? You good? I only got halfway through. No, less than half of truth. But what's also true, though, is we, you guys didn't uh, do any study on your own, so why don't you do the second half of it, and I'll try to speed up next week, and we'll, we'll work on that a little bit. We're going to cover the werewolves next time. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have less than two minutes to get our existence. And don't forget, we're going to start moving into the... Uh, Isaiah 53, and then the whole real strong, the best description of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, of course, is Isaiah. The gospel book has one of any description of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for uh, this study, and uh, I pray I don't confuse them so much. Thanks for uh, some clarity, and I ask that you would be with all of us as we continue our study. Help us in our individual studying and as we come together that we will see your truth uh, as that of the, the God who does come with vengeance and with salvation, uh, knowing that we are the ones who have been redeemed by you. Help us to have that peace and assurance that your will is being done and nobody's going to be able to take that away. And grant us your peace in all of that. We ask this in Jesus' name.